get started here. So uh, I'm Jake. I uh, work on Spinnaker at Google, and I'm going to tell you about the Spinnaker OSS release process. Um, so this talk is uh, broken up into two different parts. It's the implementations of the release process before and after our uh, 1.0 um, OSS release. And so for each of the each of the before and after, I'm going to go through sort of like the technical details, uh, show you how like how the sausage is made, and then we'll talk about how uh, how like what that means for the end user and, and and like how usable is it and what does that buy you. All right, so hold on. Uh, so before we get too far into the details about like how we do any of the releasing, we need to understand exactly what we're dealing with when we're dealing with Spinnaker. So just as a quick uh, architecture summary. Um, so Spinnaker is 10 in independently scalable microservices. So they're separately configurable and deployable. And, uh, and obviously are deployed together to make one Spinnaker instance. Uh, so another caveat that we need to be aware of is every, uh, uh, every microservice has independent uh, source repository on GitHub. So there's 10 microservices, there's 10 repositories. All right. So here is sort of like the old um, old flow, I guess, of uh, how, how everything was built and published. Um, so the rough sort of outline of how we, how we went through development and sort of release uh, before 1.0 was the following. So every, all development was done against uh, the master branches of all the components. Um, at some point in time, uh, as a developer or whoever the maintainer, you decide you're ready, uh, you know, feature ready or fix some fixes in and you're ready for, for a release. For, so what that means in the old context is you decide that basically you want to go ahead and cut a release of some subset of the microservices. Um, and essentially what you do is you'd uh, buy one of these two, uh, one of these two sort of paths, you'd go ahead and kick off your build, and you're, you're sort of done. Um, so there's a two or three, I think there's three caveats I want to talk about uh, in, in specifically here. So as soon as that build, that build and publish process was done, um, all of those artifacts were publicly available. So you can go ahead and do a sudo apt get update, repull everything, and everything is live. Um, so second thing is notice that there's no uh, validation built into that process. So everything was publicly available, and like no, you know, nowhere through that process was there, uh, other than sort of like the unit tests that everybody, the Spock tests, um, there's no sort of integration tests or deployments of that through that. Um, so as you, and the third thing is, so as you can see here, every, all the um, components are, were the, the paths, the sort of uh, build paths are all parallel. So if you, for instance, if you change, you know, three uh, services and you want to release all, you know, you want to make a release that contains all that, you have to actually do three different um, separate uh, build and publish of the artifacts. Um, so there's so there's no uh, there was no orchestration across services. Everything was sort of siloed in between services. All right. So that's sort of like the physical uh, paths to you know how you would build and and publish artifacts. So let's talk more about sort of like organizational behavior that that we would do. So um, like as I said, component releases. So the microservice releases are all ad hoc on features and fixes. So you'd pretty much uh, developers would pretty much decide when it was time. Uh, they felt ready. They would just go ahead and make cuts, uh, and everything was public. Uh, we generally had a roll forward development philosophy. So, if if you identified a fix, or sorry, identified a bug or an issue, uh, generally we didn't uh, suggest to do sort of full Spinnaker rollbacks. That's a pretty work intensive. Uh, so, what we do is we basically go ahead, uh, push another fix, cut another release, and say, okay, um, just roll forward the head. That's that's sort of our that was sort of our operational model. Um, as I alluded to, so circling back around the validation, uh, the, the artifacts themselves were already public prior to us doing validations. We would take essentially everything that was latest, go ahead and deploy that and run, run some of our integration tests against it. Um, and the other caveat there is that was basically only sort of internally visible. So uh, the validation results, if we, if we identified a bug, uh, what we would do is essentially communicate that to other devs on Slack, or if somebody saw the same bug and reported it, we would we'd sort of have that communication uh, channel with them. So that's quite, it was quite an informal sort of, uh, uh, you know, cycle to, to get bugs addressed and uh, sort of communicate that back out. So 
given that, here's some of like here's some of the user experiences that that we sort of uh, identified. So so obviously, since the releases are ad hoc, uh, updates are, are sort of ad hoc as well. Um, so depending on your cadence of when you updated, you could pull in unwanted changes. So everything fixes, features, breaking changes, whatever was all merged into master. That that's how the you know that's how sort of how we did the um, development process. So you know, at a at a given time where you go and update Spinnaker wholesale, you might be pulling in, you know, tens of or in in some weird cases, you know, hundreds of uh, new commits that maybe don't touch providers you care about or what have you. Um, so in between updates or sort of deployments of Spinnaker, there's no there was no real way to keep track of what's what your version profiles were for all the services. Um, so you have such and such an Orca running, such and such a cloud driver. And there is no like there's no sort of container to to say all right this is Spinnaker X. Uh, it, was, it was sort of just a random assortment. Um, so importantly, essentially, uh, no two uh, customers had the same Spinnaker running either. So because the updates are all ad hoc and basically push on the consumers, um, every, you know everybody had their own tempo. So whenever people were reporting bugs, there was basically no consistent look at Spinnaker. Um, so along the same along the same thread, uh, bug reports. Uh, so you know, if you found an issue, wanted to report it to us, it wasn't as simple as okay, I'm running on Spinnaker 1.0. I have you know, you would have to report. First of all, you'd have to know all the services that that uh, you know are sort of surrounding that, or have the devs ask you for you know, I need to know Orca and Cloud Driver version. So you have to report several versions back to us to get anything fixed or addressed. Um, so uh, when the, these, uh, the, the microservices were cut uh, as releases also, there is no real broadcast or, or sort of notification channels um, to alert end users that new features are available. We'd sort, we'd, similarly to uh, how bugs are reported, we'd essentially communicate that through Slack to parties that we knew were uh, interested in knowing about, and, you know, knowing about whatever features are getting up uh, Cut. Um, obviously, rollbacks uh, required tons of manual intervention, and same thing with upgrades. Really, um, you know, there was no nice and clean way to do wholesale updates uh, without running, you know, shelling into your machines and running, uh, you know, an app get or whatever. Um, and essentially, you had no insurance that your Spinnaker, uh, you know, your your version profile of Spinnaker, uh, that the microservices work together. So we would every night. Um, you know, take the latest, but there are, were several, there are often several releases of a microservice during the day. So you could be two, three versions. You know, if you'd updated during that day, you could be two, three versions behind what actually was uh, deployed and tested that night. Uh, so uh, quite a fast moving project. Um, all right, so let's tell uh, a little bit of a war story here. So the user experience we just described leads to situations that happen like this. So suppose you're running uh, on Spinnaker in the first row there, so your old deployment. The yellow here, and you want to pick up some sweet new feature in Cloud Driver. That's the green version there. You say, "All right, uh, you know, I haven't I haven't updated everything recently, so I'm going to go ahead and and sort of run and and shell in and app get update." And so, say this happens. So, you know, you upgrade you upgrade your Cloud Driver. It turns out there's a bug in Orca uh, that that has to do with not interacting well with that specific version of Cloud Driver. So, go ahead and report the bug. Uh, you know, there, there's another quick fix and a, a version bump, and you say, "All right, I'm just gonna, we'll see, we'll see what happens here. I'm gonna go ahead and bump up my uh, my version of Orca." Um, so it turns out, as it uh, as it as it happens, that that version of Orca that you just bumped into, uh, bumped up into, doesn't work with the front 50 you had in the first place. Um, so now, okay, so okay, we have you know we have another cycle of reporting a bug issue. Um, Let's not do that one yet. Uh, so you have another, you know, you have another uh, bump of, of front 50. Uh, you go through that cycle, you update to that, then you, we're going to complete the last leg of the triangle. So now front 50 doesn't work. Something, you know, some hap some some configuration property changed in front 50 uh, that that doesn't jive with that cloud driver. Um, so finally, uh, you know, so you've done three updates now, right? Uh, so you finally ask the dev, okay, like what? I just want it to work now. Like I want that. I want that new feature, but you know, I need I need stuff to work also. 
Uh, so you ask and say, all right, what, what, what have you guys tested recently? Like, what actually works? And it turns out that the next version there, so you finally uh, can update to something that actually works. But, okay, so let's sort of reflect on that. So you did, uh, you know, three or four different upgrades. Uh, you know, there's like, things like this, this incompatibility in between certain microservice versions. That happens all the time. Um, so all this is manual work. So you, you had to go in, shell in, update everything. Uh, and so, you know, how, how, look how many versions. So suppose even if there's just one change, like how many changes did you just uh, pull in from trying to get, trying to get, just move one little uh, version of CloudDriver? So a ton of wasted work. And uh, who remembers at any given time, like, so looking at this, yeah, okay, you have a nice little picture. Who remembers two, you know, the first, the first update? Like, what did that look like? So try, this is just three of the services, mind you. So try doing that every nine or 10. Uh, it gets hairy. It gets, it gets pretty nasty to go ahead and maintain an update this. All right. Um, so the actual list is over there of the issues with the, uh, uh, the, the old release process. Um, but we're going to, we'll go ahead and sort of uh, collate that down. All right. So major issue is uh, there's no way to identify component versions that work together. Uh, so, you know, like I said, we, 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 would, we would do sort of nightly just ad hoc uh, some profile version, or sorry, ver, uh, profile of, of uh, Spinnaker or service versions and test those out. Uh, those are never published anywhere. No, you know, there's no real uh, insight into which, which versions work with which. Um, as I said earlier, uh, no, two, no, you know, no two deployments look alike. So customer A looks totally different from customer B. Uh, upgrades. Uh, you know, even if you just want a tiny little fix, you wind up, since everything is pushed onto master or merged into master, um, you pull in everybody's changes that happen in, in between the time <coughs> that you updated and you want to, uh, you know, you last updated and you want to update now. Um, so that's, you know, the little uh, diagram sort of illustrates that. Um, there's, yep, there's no easy rollback or upgrade, really. So, you know, it's all manual work uh, and essentially no release documentation. Your best guess uh, in the old world was basically to go ahead and read the, the commit stream. So go on and GitHub and check out what happened. And uh, finally, uh, well, semi-finally, uh, validation after artifact publication. So, you know, there it's highly likely or, you know, definitely likely that you could update at any given time and your, the, you know, even the latest built versions are totally broken together. Happened many times. Um, just generally just hard to maintain and run. Um, so that was the old one. We, we sort of did some reflection uh, so, uh, last, you know, December into January when we were deciding on how do we, you know, how do we make this better? Like, what do we want in, 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 a, in a release, in a Spinnaker release, a good Spinnaker release? Um, so we came up with these, uh, these, six, these six sort of uh, aspects that we wanted to strive for. Uh, so we wanted to identify version components that work together and actually make sure that they do. Uh, obviously, validation prior to artifact publish, or at least prior to, to us, you know, sort of uh, blessing a version or a version profile and saying this is, you can use this and it, we, we are pretty sure that it's going to work together where you didn't have any insurance like that prior. Um, obviously, release documentation. So even if you do have to, you know, uh, pick up everybody's changes, you actually know what you're getting. So at least you can have some insight into, uh, you know, what sort of new things Spinnaker might be doing you're not expecting it to do. Uh, you weren't expecting it to do before. Uh, encapsulated fixes. So what this means is we, we wanted a way to sort of insulate the, you know, so Spinnaker is a really fascinating project. It's one of its, you know, the development pace is one of its uh, you know, sort of benefits, I think. Um, but but it, it sort of gets you into trouble in cases where you, you really just want a small fix and, and it's, you know, you have something that's really close to working. Um, but you you know you just need a little, a little tweak here and there or some you know some some uh, some uh, like I said like a little tweak and then maybe it'll be perfect for you. Um, but you couldn't there's no real uh, method to get that out without pulling in a whole bunch of unnecessary changes. Uh, so that's what I mean by encapsulated fixes. Um, easy upgrade rollback that's obvious uh, that can you know that always can get better. And uh, easy configuration and, and sort of management of the Spinnaker that's already running. All right, so you know after that reflection, we sort of uh, sat down and, and, and wrote out a, a big design for a new release process. 
Um, so there's two parts to the new release process. There's uh, this is sort of a tautology, but a new OSS release process, and that's the first part. And the second part is hired. So something that that given given you know the artifacts and some, some maybe some accounting and uh, accounting data and metadata can go ahead and and consume that and use that to make you know running, managing, configuring, spinning through <coughs> uh, easier, yes, sorry, easier to manage. Um, so Lars gave uh, a talk yesterday on Halyard. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and, and, and dive into the details of the OSS release process, new OSS release process. All right, so here is, here is the sort of uh, overview, the flow. So what I'm going to do here is I'm, I'm going to describe a, a sort of new um, artifacts. So you see, obviously, there's a lot more going on here than there was in the previous one. So what I'm going to do is uh, say sort of what we, what we introduced, uh, go into each detail, each in, in sort of detail, and then wrap back around and say, all right, here's what all this means uh, for this new flow, and then what this buys you as, a, as an end user. So the three new things are uh, the bill of materials down on the bottom right there. So I'm going to refer to those as bombs. Uh, the release branches um, in the actual upstream source repos, and then change logs. Uh, so those are the three things. So like I said, we're going to dive in detail. And we'll circle back around. All right, so first thing, and arguably the most interesting, is uh, the build materials. So this contains metadata per each service uh, that, that will sort of wraps and contains a set of service versions as a Spinnaker release. Um, so there's a subsection, you know, like a sort of services part, where for each microservice we pin a version uh, that you know that obviously rolls forward, and uh, an artifact location, so where you can find um, containers and you know, container images and Debian's of that service, um, the commit that we we built that version at, and the creation date. Um, and so alongside that, uh, the set you know sort of metadata set of versions. We go ahead and give that that bomb, the bill of material, an overarching version. That is exactly equal to a Spinnaker version. So it's just a, basically a container, a bunch of metadata, and that that that'll define a Spinnaker version for you. Um, so because we supply the artifact location and the commits and everything, we can do that. That sort of buys us two things. So one is that provides all the context necessary for Halyard to go ahead and deploy. Um, you know, uh, pull down the artifacts that were produced and configure a Spinnaker uh, version. Um, and secondly, we can actually go from a bomb to the source that we that um, you know exists in GitHub that we built this from. So you can, if you wanted to, um, go ahead and recreate our builds if you you know if you wanted to do sort of like a vulnerability analysis or anything like that. You know, repeatable builds. So we can get the exact source that we built uh, this Spinnaker version from. From uh, from the bill materials, and here is a uh, just a little snippet. You see, we have services section. There is an overarching. I think I, I neglected to add an actual version for this, but there there'd be a at the level of the services entry, there'd be a version field, and that would be the version that is the Spinnaker version that's defined uh, by this set of microservices. All right, the second uh, new artifact here is the upstream uh, release branch. So what we would do is, uh, so nightly, uh, we produce sort of, uh, I guess, uh, you know, date, date stamped versions of, like, a, that's the, referring to the top level Spinnaker version of the services. Go ahead and deploy them and then test them. Um, and subsequently, what we would do is uh, take, so once, once we decided that a bill, of, like, a Spinnaker version defined by a bill of materials, uh, was you know validated and we felt good about it. We go ahead and rename that and then publish that to Halyard, make it visible to Halyard to, as a as a viable, uh, deployable, supported Spinnaker version. Um, so part of that process, we'd go ahead and push an upstream branch uh, up to the upstream repos that is total is uh, obviously cut off at the commit that the uh, we released in the bill of materials. And for the purpose of insulating that against the changes in master. So what we do, what we'd use with this is, um, so, you know, we're not perfect. So we'll cut a release, and maybe there'll be something wrong with the release. And we want to fix. You know, we want to go ahead and, and co somebody cooks up a fix for an issue they see. But we want to we want to put that in the release without going ahead and including every single change in master that's happened since then. Uh, so these uh, branches allow you to do that. You all you have to do is cherry pick it in, 
and uh, go ahead and cut another subsequent uh, patch release, so like patch version in Semver, uh, using the release branch as the base branch instead of instead of master as in the usual case. Um, and this has the obviously it's obviously isolates fixes to uh, to the releases from the the developments happening on master. And so you get the the sort of guarantee that okay if you bump a Spinnaker version up only a patch version you understand you're only getting patches you can have that guarantee. All right, uh, so here's just an example of, if you've seen these on GitHub, here's what some of the release branches look like. Okay, uh, the, the, the third and sort of final new um, artifact type that we have in the new release process is a change log. So um, if you guys have been looking at the commit message, commit stream recently, you see these are, are specially formatted uh, uh, commit messages, and that's for the purpose of, uh, so we have an automated tool that you can essentially give a to, or sorry, from and to, uh, commit range to, and it'll go ahead and scrape out all the changes that happened in that commit range. So what we do is we build that into uh, a, a nice looking YAML file, uh, so, and, and that, that's, that'll summarize the, the changes that have been included in that Spinnaker release. Um, and we go ahead and actually publish these up to uh, Spinnaker IO every time we actually cut a release. This is public. Uh, there's, you know, there's several uh, sort of uh, channels of notifications. All right, so let's circle back around. Uh, so now that we understand each of the sort of new um, artifacts, let's let's see how we can sort of tie it tie it all together. So in the new OSS release process flow, uh, we have sort of three phases, and this is this is. Uh, the three phases of uh, build, validate, publish. Um, so obviously build, we're building the deployable artifacts. Uh, we go ahead and label uh, the microservice version. So we use tags in the upstream repos to track what, what microservice version it is. Um, as I said, as you, as, the, as you saw in the bomb, so we, we keep track of those to, to, gain, you know, to gain insight in whether, like what kind of fixes are happening to the microservices themselves. Uh, but you know, use the overarching version to sort of shield you if you don't if you don't necessarily care about uh, the the development pace at any each of the services. Um, so, as I said, build step records records the versions and uh, commits in the build of materials. So, uh, you know, we build the artifacts, essentially generate the uh, build of materials, and then go ahead and generate the change log from that. Uh, so, since we have the source there, uh, validate. So, uh, in that step, we go ahead and use the bomb. So using the bomb, feed that to Halyard and use Halyard to deploy uh, Spinnaker into several environments and run our uh, side tests, so integration tests against, Spinnaker, against those running Spinnakers. Um, so obviously if this is green, we, we can we consider that bomb to be you know, a successful bomb and if we wanted to, we can go ahead and sort of rename that and publish that as a, uh, you know, a real life Spinnaker version. Um, if it's red, obviously we have to sort of go into our feedback loop and uh, figure out what happened, you know, and, and sort of get those, those things addressed. So provided that we have a green build, um, the, the publish step in this is, so we, we have a sort of nightly, um, uh, like I said, date stamp version of, of the build materials that we try out every night. And so if we have a green one, we have a green build validation step, uh, we can subsequently go ahead and, and give that a proper semantic version name, and we, we, we sort of go case by case and decide what the next uh, version is. So, so far we've just been, every, every uh, release that has not been a patch release has been minor, and that's sort of, uh, you know, at our discretion. But, uh, so we give it a, a, le a legitimate um, semantic version and go ahead and um, go ahead and do a couple other things. So we publish the release branches up to the GitHub, uh, GitHub repositories, uh, we publish a change log to Spinnaker IO, as I said. We send uh, and then send notifications out. So we uh, have an e we have a Spinnaker Google group that we that we email. Uh, we have a Slack notification. Obviously, there's a release uh, process channel, and uh, simply by and then also you know the, having the page show up on Spinnaker IO is another sort of set of notifications. Okay, so given that sort of physical flow, this is what. The, the sort of we've seen as the sort of new user experience. So, um, obviously, the but the bill of materials give you a lot of insight into exactly which uh, Spinnaker versions you have running and deployed at any given time. 
Uh, bug reports really only require one, you know, you need to know one number. That's the finicky version you're on. It's great. Um, there's, uh, we try to make, you know, use as, uh, as many notification methods as possible to communicate a release. Um, it's all summarized and, and sort of uh, traceable in change logs. Uh, we've been cutting patch releases using, you know, using cherry picks and isolated fixes. Um, so, you know, we can, we can fix small issues without having to go ahead and, and, and include everybody else's changes. Um, upgrades and rollbacks now of Spinnaker versions, of top-level Spinnaker versions, require now two Halyard commands, which is awesome compared to what it was before. Um, and all the releases are validated uh, prior to publishing, which is important. All right, so all those things that we, we sort of were complaining about, we're happy. All right, and back to, so let's uh, go back to that war story. So instead, so instead of having your three or four updates that you had to do, uh, you, can, you can simply, you know, you, you can even use Halyard to say, all right, what's the, you know, is there anything new? What's the newest, uh, latest, hottest thing? And say, okay, um, I'm going to use my two Halyard commands, and now, bam, I'm on the, the next validated version. You have pretty reasonable confidence that, that you, you know, you're good to go after that. All right, uh, so that's all I had. I hope, thanks for coming. I hope that sort of uh, shed some light and uh, you know, describes sort of what we're doing internally to, you know, to make your experience as, as, as sort of like flawless as possible. All right, any questions? Yeah, Tim. Oh, what's the, uh, what's the fail rate? Like how, how many point releases do not make it through integration testing? Uh, it depends on, the, it really depends on the week. Like we, we do this every night. So, it, you know, we, we, we still are ad hoc uh, making releases based on, you know, whatever the state of the master is, or sorry, master head is. Uh -huh. um, but it's, I, it's hard to say. I, like I said, it depends week to week. Like of the seven days last week, how, yeah. many, how many night leads went through? I think probably three. Three, four. So it's like it's it, less than you'd hope. It's less than you'd hope, but it's still you know it's still that no, whole. It's actually good because it means you didn't release stuff that people. Yeah, would that's end right. There's there's a what up, Eric? Yeah, yeah no, I mean we we have a, a higher fail rate of builds than we would like, and some of them are are bugs in Spinnaker, and some of them are are other types of issues. Some of them are platform specific because we in testing we we test all the platforms that um, have integration tests. We run. All that available. So the reasons for, for failure vary, um, and, and they're less than we. It's a higher rate than um, we expected. Right, but, uh, um, but the but important it, part is like there's we fail on any. It's not like we 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 haven't we haven't done any you know uh, rollouts where we say okay most things work but this doesn't. It's we we only release if everything is green. Got so it. that's that's a that's an important point to that. Yeah. If, um, what do you, the integration test look like? Like, what is, what's that process of like deploying it? Like, how many environments are you deploying it to? Right. So what I are think you doing? Eric can Eric can correct me if I'm wrong here. Um, I believe we're deploying to each of, uh, so on a single VM, not a, not necessarily a distributed VM environment, but we deploy to uh, GCP, EC2, and I believe we had uh, we had Azure uh, until recently. Um, and I think we, do we also deploy to Kubernetes as well? So this is where we're deploying Spinnaker to. Do you have Kubernetes, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. so to Kubernetes as well. Uh, all using Halyard and all using just the, you know, the regular configuration steps through Halyard. Um, and, and then. We, we, from that, we also run the integration tests. And they're all open source. So yeah. they're all okay. in, the, in the Spinnaker repository. Right. Um, and then on each of those, we configure all the provider accounts, so that includes other platforms, um, DCOS and, and um, some other things where we don't actually deploy Spinnaker to, and we run whatever tests they provide. And again, um, you know, currently on each of those deployments, and when everything is green, um, that qualifies it for a release. Yeah, does that answer your question? All right. Yeah. Hi, uh, yeah. Uh, I've obviously gone through a bunch of different iterations on how we deploy uh, Spinnaker. Okay. But going back, say, seven or eight months ago, we were pretty focused on trying to make Spinnaker work on our internal operating system, which happened to be Red Hat Enterprise Linux based. Okay. So at the time, I committed a, a few PRs to make the builds um, out of the Jenkins jobs actually work successfully for building the RPMs and sure. kind of got that all working. And okay. I opened. Um, 
two issue tickets uh, in GitHub. Okay. One to try to get uh, the open source community to make RPMs as part of the official build, right. and then second one to make the. At that time, I was using like the install Spinnaker shell script yep. as my me mechanism for doing kind of installs right. to make that um, work. Right now, it's basically an Ubuntu only kind of uh, shell script, but there's kind of like some stubs in there to, to make it work for RPMs. So right. I feel like the amount of work left to do to make this actually come to completion is pretty small. Okay. Can I respond to that? Uh, okay. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. If you have if you have opinions about it. Uh, yeah. So Gary Danko from my company submitted a bunch of PRs to get it working for Red Hat, and then got pulled off to do other things, and so he never merged a bunch of them. Okay. And so there's a lot of stuff that uh, I wanted to that I was going to jump on and close up and hopefully. All right. So so it seems like and this is this is something that like you know we we just haven't. I think extend this far enough, but yeah. you know, there's definitely pathways in this release process to like any. We can build any number of artifact types. If that's not really, uh, if you can do it, I don't know if this is viable or not. But if you could do it in Halyard instead of install Spinnaker, that would, it would be a lot better. I agree. I, I, that's why I started out my comment by saying like this was going back like nine months ago. Yeah. Sure. That, yeah. that like that was kind of the state of the art at the time. But I just feel like the point that I wanted to make is that until someone who's responsible for the open source build. Mm -hmm. Commits to taking the changes that I made and actually like right. doing those builds and publishing them somewhere. It's pretty difficult for anybody else in the open source community to really drive this to completion because, like, I could make the script work uh -huh. if the RPMs were there, but I can't make you put the RPMs where I think they need to go. Okay. Right. Um, yeah, I think this is something we can follow up online with. But like I said, uh, so I have I was in contact with Gary whenever he was we was sort of pushing through this this RPM stuff. There's you know, there's 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 several pieces to it, so it's a bit more complicated than yeah, sure. But uh, but yeah, th you know, we could we could hack that off as a real work item to start. You know, whenever. Uh, I'd but love let's take that off. Jump in on that conversation because I wanted to pick it up where he left off. Okay. He, he just he honestly got pulled off of Spinnaker and into other stuff. Okay. And I, I, he was he kind of went radio silent. I was a bit. He was like yeah. very very like personal and talkative, and it's all I thought I thought I made him mad. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, he, he, he honestly fell off the board with us. Too, okay. Okay. I reached out to him the other day, and he's like, "Yeah, I'm not working on that anymore." All right. And so I had to pick. Yeah. This is this is absolutely like this is yeah. this is great feedback. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. Hey, uh, can you share some? Thoughts around the validation aspect, uh, kind of testing you guys do yeah. before you move things into production. Not just the core services, but uh, you know the pipelines and the integrated systems that that is hooked up with the pipelines. Right. So we have uh, several different types of integration tests. There's a bunch of just um, sort of generic smoke tests. So we'll you know we'll create a load balancer, create a server group, um, just to make sure that everything's sort of functioning properly. We also have uh, a test that. That create the post the pipeline to Orca goes ahead and triggers a, a sort of Jenkins job to finish, and that that's as the trigger to the pipeline. It's that as the trigger to the pipeline. So we we sort of test that uh, that stuff uh, flows. But you know there, this can always get better. Like we can always run on run, run more types of tests, like more types of load balancing, more uh, 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 you know di testing different platforms, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know we have we have a you know we don't have. A, Excellent integration test coverage, but we test that you know the main the main primitives are gonna are gonna work with with sort of high uh, confidence there. Answer your question. Start off. Oh, okay. Yeah. Go ahead. I've just been briefly reviewing the integration test code here. Yeah. Had looked at it before, and um, I know that one thing that uh, the, the folks at Target have been doing before was UI testing. I think. Okay. Um, and it looks like this is integration, but more API driven. Right. And I guess is that. I guess, obviously. Is so. Are, are, is, sorry. Are your are your, is your question? Um, so are we going to at some point go ahead and include more UI testing, or or drive that from the UI, or I what? I guess it, it's more like how satisfied are you with sort of the status of integration testing now? Do you think it's it's covering the right stuff the right way? Um, I, I think Eric can give a. Pretty yeah, no, so we, we do not test DEC at all in, as part of the, the integration testing. Um, the expectation was that somebody else within the community, we've had conversations for the past year about this for various people. It hasn't happened, but um, that's an opportunity for, for other people in the community. Uh, our, um, so Spinnaker 
the code base in Spinnaker has extensive unit tests and, and mocking and stuff. But the mocks don't tell you it'll actually work on a provider. So our, our tests were more geared to ensuring that the provider integration parts work. And then given Netflix scale of usage and everything, we kind of assumed that some of that experience would, would carry forward into the general integrity of, of Spinnaker itself for, um, for the fun, fundamental stuff. But if other people within the community want to write tests, we'll run them as part of our yeah, they're, they're all open process, source, and we, we're actually encouraging you know uh, folks that are writing new providers to go ahead and, and supply a, a set of um, uh, integration tests that we can run. Like everything is everything's open source. It's can refine what I, what I think I'm trying to ask. Here. Sure. Um, as the people managing the releases on this, do you think that are you satisfied with how much it, it slipped through or not? I mean, that's what always the question is. Like, are you? That you are, how frequently are you hitting yourself and saying, shit, that app shouldn't have, like, why didn't we? I see. Oh, so, like, but do you feel like, do we not cover all, do we not cover, I mean, it's certainly not, it's not every edge case. Like, it, that's, that's, you know, that's, it's not, it's not there yet. But I think we do due diligence on, like I said, on the, on the core workflows people are using and leveraging. I think similar to this line of questioning, is it easy for end users to check out uh, test suites and sort of run them and extend them by themselves for all the, other extensions or maybe deck uh, VM prober testing with Firefox sandboxing. Sure, uh, extend like it's a bit, it's a bit challenging to extend at this point. But in terms of, I sorry, that's that's not exactly true. Like writing the test is fine. Uh, it's it's more like there's an underlying sort of uh, uh, set you know, interface, a set of primitives. It's sort of hard to you know it's hard to get into. But once you understand it, it sort of it sort of makes sense. It's easy to write tests. You can a lot of the tests are are sort of. Uh, they, they're they're shaped the same way, meaning like, go ahead, Eric. Uh, you you specifically uh, said end users as opposed to developers. Yeah. Oh no, I did actually mean developers. Like okay. say I, because, I extended uh, Orca and I want to so, test it. Because and it's the private. way the the tests were designed was actually, and, and we don't do this, but the original intent it was to allow people to um, run the tests to validate their deployments. So they were meant they were, they were designed and built for end users actually to be able to run them from a technical standpoint so the tests adapt to the environment rather than assuming a particular environment. Um, but then the other part was, is that easy? And um, um, it's easy to do from source, but it's not, you know, if, if you need to download Git repositories and, and stuff like that to, to do it. Um, but that is long term. That that's the intent. If if there was need to, to do that, um, th that's the idea behind it. But in practice, that that doesn't happen. We run the tests. The test environment is a deployment, so we're we're doing that. But it, you know, we're doing it as um, from that developer Jenkins job. Yeah. Regarding the comment about extending Orca. Just yeah. In, in general, when we extend and we have some kind of like uh, internal proprietary algorithm that we are privy to contribute back to upstream, right? Um, how then do we manage the merging process, especially now that we have this uh, release branching strategy and perhaps cherry picking may may give us some uh, flexibility? But in general, what's the what's the general pattern that, that folks have been applying in regard to like uh, extension and how to align to I see what you're saying. Okay, so this is something actually that we that um, Eric and I talked about recently. So if I understand you correctly, you you would like to use um, the sort of uh, tested and 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 like validated releases, but go ahead and then use those internally as in as like the the base jar to your extension code, right? Yeah. Right. So um, currently we don't we don't have any support for you know sort of resolving those versions, um, but what you can do. Uh, so as you, you saw the bomb, so what you can do is essentially point to uh, point to the correct uh, bin tray repository and set the version to the version of the of whatever service you you care about um, to the the bomb version. So this is all like you know you you can just basically by inspection go ahead and pull the correct like version of the jar and understand that you're on such and such a Spinnaker version. Does that make sense? 
those versions tags or are they? Yes, uh, they're so. Uh, right, the the microservice the microservice versions are pushed upstream as tags, but all of that metadata is collected in the bill of materials. That's really only the the only file you need to to, to sort of grok and understand where where the so I mean it even tells you in there where to the the, the URL to fetch the Debian files from. Um, so that should be all of the sort of metadata you need to subsequently take that and, and, and send, extend internally. Make sense? Yeah, it totally does. Thank okay. you. Second question, though, yep. if you don't mind. Uh, regarding licensing, uh, our, our, during the uh, paneling uh, session, we talked about licensing. Um, while Spinnaker isn't you know, in business of selling, I mean, Netflix isn't in business of selling Spinnaker, but if in the event that there is a dependency to an upstream artifact, which may have some complication with licensing. Uh, is there any process to sort of like observe that and block that from getting into uh, a spinnaker release? Or do we have some kind of retro uh, perspective to uh, kind of cause that? So you're saying as a, a, a dependency of spinnaker has a licensing issue? Right. If there's an upstream dependency, mm -hmm. right, a transitive dependency. Yep. Uh, I know that. Um, guys being Google audited all of the dependencies of Spinnaker um, to make sure they were all in a compliant license sure. compatible with ASL um, and it's just I guess on us as committers to make sure that we don't allow new dependencies and I mean it's we would probably pay fairly close attention to somebody submitting a pull request that adds new to any of the services in general, um, but one of the things I would specifically be looking for is what is the licensing on that um, on that library. Really, my question was in that build that Jenkins uh, sure. you know, component that you have on, on a diagram, whether you have an assertion process there to block builds if there is a violation. Oh uh, no, we don't. So I, I, my my guess, my best guess is what we would do in that case is so if we had if we had a published a version where there's some there's some sort of licensing issue, we would have to basically deprecate that and, and pull that back from uh, being you know sort of a public released uh, Spinnaker version. That's that's essentially I guess the uh, the process we'd have now. But there you're, there's no there's no like precondition check to that now. Do you have any performance uh, tests or benchmarks for each service? Uh, so performance testing or benchmarks? No, as you mean compared to like one, from one provider to another? Uh, no, like for any provider when you're changing uh, code in every releases, uh, you want to make sure like uh, it's not uh, like showing any memory leaks or any other uh, characteristics? Uh, we don't have any formal like uh, performance measurement like that now. No, but we, we do want to start running squeeze testing, so that's something that we do want to put in our suite of integration tests. It's a good point. Yeah, go ahead. As a contributor, should we be thinking about these integration tests and, um, and adding to them? And certainly, yeah. If, if that, yeah, it's definitely, uh, you know, would be a big help, especially, you know, particularly if you're adding adding sort of new functionality or a whole new module or something that doesn't have any, any integration test cover. That definitely... Do they run on PRs in some way, or how, how can we validate the integration tests, I guess, if we're writing them? Asking how to run them. How to run? Yeah, the, so do they, do they validate I, on pull requests to the Spinnaker repo? They no, they're too expensive to I think validate in every PR. Oh, oh, I see what you're saying. When do we run them? Yeah. So we, we, yeah, yeah, yeah. They don't, they don't. That we only run the unit tests on pull on pull requests. Right. This, uh, this process that I've outlined is uh, nightly, and then and and oftentimes, you know, more more than once a day. If right. if we want to go ahead and cut a release, we'll go ahead and run run this process several times. But if, if I'm least, writing an integration least, test, <laughs> how do I know that I'm writing a good integration test? I guess is my question. It's my question too. Like you want to download this stuff and run your own, right? And, yeah. and then add one and maybe upstream it or maybe not. Yeah. And you're you're asking how do we how do we check that how do you run the integration tests? How do you spin up a spinnaker and then run it? Yeah, so I just built on yeah. my workstation okay. and I started and I want to run the full suite of integration tests by myself. Okay. And then add one. And maybe it's a, it's a simple, yeah, it's sort of short. Okay, so if you have a Spinnaker running, it's as simple as cloning the Spinnaker Spinnaker repo and then running like a Python command, basically, with all the correct, uh, like that's that, like the actual pulling and running and checking that your build didn't, didn't screw anything up, or you, yeah, your your uh, Spinnaker change didn't screw anything up. Yeah, that's that's pretty straightforward. I think we could probably even, you know, make that a little easier to say if you want to run. 
I want to run the whole suite or some some you know subsection of it. But there's it's 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 fairly straightforward. Yeah, good. Uh, so kind of a follow up to this question: um, Has there been any thought of creating like a lighter weight um, set of tests just for at PR level, just you know, to kind of reduce the number of uh, failures that are coming in? Because I mean, having a PR system where other people are looking at things is good, but I always uh, think that you know, human eyes <coughs> can play tricks on you. Yeah, absolutely. It's the 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 tricky thing is like I don't think necessarily. It's it's the deploying spinnaker is sort of the heavy lifting here, and then right, it's like yeah. I mean the traffic afterwards when you're running the test is sort of small, but it's you're you're asking for you're asking for us to deploy nine things on a PR. That's mm -hmm. like well, you know I, what I mean that's is, that's sort of like a what I'm saying is maybe point. maybe it doesn't have to be an automated part of it because I agree with you right like bringing up a stack stuff yeah, right it's, it's, but maybe it could be part mm -hmm. of like the like acceptance criteria like did you do this right like did you. Uh, like, did you have a, did, is this covered by a unit test of some sort or an integration test of some sort? Or, or did you run and, an integration test yeah. prior to this? Yeah, exactly. Um, like, as like a, a prior. Um, it's sort of hard to verify. I mean, it's, it's like your word, right? So it's kind yeah. of. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But it's something to think true. about. Yeah, certainly. From like a process perspective more than anything else. Yeah, to, uh, to my knowledge, I, I mean, I don't see us immediately changing that, but that, that is something that we have thought about. And initially, whenever we were, um, you know, hashing out what we're going to do for validation, that, that came up as, you know, how do we, like, when do we run these integration tests and, like, what's the process behind that? And that definitely came up as one of the uh, things that we talked to. Yeah. Are there any plans to kind of make that, uh, I believe it was a Jenkins process that shows the bill, mm -hmm. the verify, and the publish, like, Available to the public? Um, not at the not at the, the the current time, but we like I said, this is this is another thing where we came across and said, all right, um, we have these things, we should we should report them. That was initially the first sort of opinion, uh, but the, the the sort of formatting is is uh, not the format. It's it's sort it's sort of hard to um, like take as a user and, and understand what that means. Uh, so just the you know the the, the just the format of that that test output is a bit like uh, opaque, especially to like a new spinnaker user. You're like, I don't I don't know what this means. There's the you know uh, also worried about leaking credentials. Yeah, that, that, that was another yeah. big issue of it is like how do we scrub those and like what is what is acceptable. So you know we we went through varying levels of all right. Let's just give the high report, high level report, but then like those names aren't super clear on what exactly is testing, and it's 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 sort of a tricky problem to do that. Yeah. Uh, in one of your previous slides, you described the new release process. Huh? Uh, so I think 1.3.0 was uh, deprecated and re released. Can you describe how this went through? So the the fact, okay, yeah. So this was a bit of a a tricky one. So we I think we published that one. We published 1.3.0. Um, I think prior to that, that, well, that, I think that one had a dependency on Halyard being updated as well, uh, but there needed to be a change that went in Halyard. So we, I think we released, we pushed 1.3.0 too quick before we pu uh, pushed the subsequent or you know, necessary Halyard fix or, or you know, new feature to, to deal with that. So that's what, that's what happened there. So we released it, sort of rolled it back, uh, you know, made sure everything was, was, was fine, and then, and then sort of re-released it. So that was a bit of like a, uh, you, you know, like, we released it a bit too soon. And the and the older version of Halyard that would deploy uh, 1.3.0 would break the deployment. I didn't try it. I yeah, I think that was what that that's yeah, that's what what's what would have happened. So like it wouldn't yeah, even if you tried it with the older version of Halyard, it's, it wasn't uh, would not have worked. We were a bit optimistic in assuming that uh, all versions of Halyard would deploy all versions of Spinnaker, but we realized it's not possible. So now in the future. If you do, if we, this happens again, Halyard will actually prevent you from deploying Spinnaker until you've updated Halyard to the correct version. Yeah, now there's Just sort of a, a, there's a window of both that, that is like sort of a tolerance. Um, it's reported in the change log, and you can see it online, but I've just noticed for other people, but the, there's a change in uh, Gates security configuration because of a Spring Boot update. So the way um, OAuth was configured yeah. changed between versions of Gates. Yeah, so your prior, like Hal config would have, would have not function properly with the new, the new gate version. That was, that was the All right, any other questions? All right, cool. Uh, thanks for coming, guys. Hopefully that was uh, informative, and hopefully you yeah, enjoyed it.